Hello and welcome to Please Don't Send Me into Outer Space, the podcast intent on exploring all that science fiction and fantasy has to offer one movie at a time. My name is Joel. My name is Sarah. My name is Pod Person Aaron. You're not supposed I <laughs> that's you know, you're already going against the thing. I mean, what you know like I'm not a pod person. Nobody said you were. Uh <laughs> No, I'm I'm the more honest of, of the pod people, Joel. I see. You're the you're the that makes you the unreliable pod person. Yeah. Like hey, you just got to do these menial tasks. Oh, can I be out there recruiting? You know, <laughs> kidnapping some more people? It's like no. Nope. You're gonna you're the one who's gonna drive around the garbage truck. Yep. I you're gonna drive it around. You that. <laughs> oh, you're right. Oh, see, could... you were the guy in the beginning. Okay, let's get. <laughs> you were the guy in the beginning when the guy took the trash out and he was like talking to the guy for a second. You're like, "Hello, fellow pod person." He's like, "Listen." Don't don't cat, let anyone catch you saying that again. Don't buddy. blow my cover. That's right. <laughs> Hell, where are you going next? Oh, that way. Okay. Well, you know what? Just just get on your truck and drive. <laughs> oh man. The movie this week is Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978, directed by Philip Kaufman and written by W.D. Richter, based on Jack Finney's novel The Body Snatchers. Starring Donald Sutherland, Brooke Adams, Jeff Goldblum, Veronica Cartwright, Leonard Nimoy, and, uh, you know, some, some other people, but that cast is so good. Yeah. It's a smooth group. Yeah. Uh, I'm about the cast, too. Mm -hmm. You just get that much nerdiness in, in one movie. You, it's it's a special moment. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, nobody can see this. <laughs> like, where, where, where's Joel going with this? Anyways. Oh, oh no. I, I know you're going with this. Oh. Uh, you were uh, marveling at the number of uh, Starfleet officers in this movie, which is only one. I'm just saying, if you were, say, on the, you know, uh, the mystery date show, or whatever that thing used to be called, and uh, your three mystery dates were Donald Sutherland, uh, Jeff Goldblum, and, and Leonard Nimoy. C contestant number one, how do you feel about wearing adhesive ears? <laughs> I knew it was you, Leonard Nimoy. I'll Take me disco dancing. The voice gave it away. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, so i picked this movie because i i frankly i lo i love it right because we've been going through a lot of my horror classic loves recently and i just there is this one's shot so well and deliberately and directed so in in such a way that is like legitimately creepy that like i i want to share it and and most people probably who are into this stuff have seen it, but I just love it. Yeah, dude, this movie is a great. It's what you just said. So unnerving, so off kilter at certain points. Uh, the weird focus on certain inanimate objects. Spooky, mm -hmm. super spooky, unnerving. Also, a number of sweaters that I wish I owned. Uh, pop up in this movie a lot and uh that makes me love this movie even more i see the fashion all about it yeah i like um i liked this movie i hadn't seen this one before um i had seen the original one um a long time ago with my mom but this one i'm surprised i didn't watch this one with her because she really loved it. but this i feel is gross. It kind of, <laughs> kind of has that retro horror thing where you see things like germinating and growing and pulsing and kind of 
you see the moistness yeah. on things and the gumminess. I mean, it is gross. It's yeah, so good. Yeah. It's so good. It's grossed in like a super effective. Like even the opening, like it starts off off the bat. Like, hey, this is kind of gross and creepy. <laughs> All like, those crazy space microbes floating around. Yeah, whatever is going on, like bubbles and smoke and and gel gelatin gross things. Oh yeah. You know. Uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah, it creeped me out because it kind of the and they did really good like photography of that stuff in the beginning. Really good uh cinematography. Um it feels like when you're watching that that it's something that aren't prepared to like fight like if you're thinking about something like let's say an alien from another planet comes you're not thinking you don't know how you would fight something uh-uh. that comes this way that's a really good point yeah. and i found that really creepy yeah like because actually alien not not like a humanoid thing that, like with a vehicle like a flying vehicle that we can somehow identify this is like what exactly yeah like a ufo you can kind of give some frame of reference to you're like oh there's probably a being in there of some sort floating around but when you're seeing a a, a weird space tuber just kind of like floating towards earth you're like "Uh -uh. uh-uh uh-uh yeah i didn't order the tubers nope seems like undetectable untraceable almost when they're first introduced to the planet's atmosphere it feels like what would you do like, how would you fight something like that? It just floated in like a cobweb. <laughs> it's really scary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they just treat it like, uh, I mean, nobody's making a big deal about it. We the, Because we were doing kind of a second watch through the night, that was the first time I noticed that they even had that article that was like about spider webs that had fallen from the sky and gotten all over the city. It's like, oh, okay, I guess if somebody casually saw that, that's what they would assume that was in all the dumpsters that they were just picking up. Well, because the thing, uh, we as humans try to rationalize everything. Of course there's spiderwebs falling from the sky. That's what it must be. Yeah. Based on the evidence of what I can see and understand? Yeah. Yeah, not space jellies. Why why would it be any sort of weird microbe thing from space, space, you know, fairing microbe? Uh Uh-uh. I don't know. It takes one brave woman to be like, hey, this plant's weird. I mean, it's not <laughs> before, you know, it possibly takes over her husband or whatever's going on. It reminds me a lot of The Thing. Oh, yeah. Because that's totally a, like, this is imitating us, but we don't even know what it looks like normally. So when when we do actually see it, but the the scope of this the, this alien thing is so... Uh, massive, like falling everywhere all at once, and just it's invasive. It's, like, oh yeah, so, like, and so um, it felt it felt scary to me to think about something like that happening because it seems like we would have no way to defend ourselves against it. In a way, in a way, um, coming from my point of view, it's almost kind of Lovecraftian. In oh, a sense, yeah. like this yeah. cosmic horror, this thing, this thing that you and you, you cannot humanly, it's unhuman. You can't, you can't process it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was thinking, we just rewatched the beginning a little bit. And, um, when I was watching the beginning again, I was thinking that it almost seems like that's the pure form of the alien. Is like the thing you see again in traveling. That might be some state of their life cycle or something, or they may be some special part of a hive or something. I don't know. But there are these things that are transporting to Earth, and then once they're here, they become a plant. But it I don't imagine that they would look necessarily like the plant someplace else. Maybe there's something else somewhere else i don't know yeah i think yeah it, like that was the most uh fertile ready thing for them to merge with or something like that that's why they came off as like a pod i there's probably a good explanation or something like that well right because the when it when it became that gelatin state it hit that plant and then from there that's what it adapted to but it'd be interesting though to see like did it adapt to anything else you know any other other uh 
Yeah, if it fell in the ocean, I wonder what that looked like. Totally, like like weird jellyfish creature thing, maybe? Creepy. I'm already scared of the ocean. I don't need any weird monster alien jellyfish. (laughs) They did this other cool thing in the beginning with, like, this swirling, like, oil and water kind of look with, like, smoke coming off of it. And I don't know if they did some, like, reverse action stuff, but it was it was not familiar looking, and they did a good job. Yeah. And then, of course, like, as soon as it gets onto the plants, it's really creepy there, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not... Uh, see, I would... I totally would take home a mysterious, weird bulb. I would like, oh, this is weird. I'm going to take it home. So, I, see, you know, I'm I'm ready to get taken you're, home. You're one of the first pod people, exactly. is what you're telling me, Joel. I, I, you know, I wouldn't bring it in the house because the cats might eat it. That's the thing. Oh. There's, like, this whole uh, resistance. They just carry cats with them everywhere. Okay. Okay. Well, cat people are okay. Yeah, cat. Those are fine. Yeah. Cat people. Cat people versus Cat dads, cat people. moms. You're safe. You're safe in the, the pod. The cats people. would probably know. They could if sense you it. were a pod person or not, and they would not be down. I think they would probably be upset and do something. Uh, the cats will lead the uprising. Yeah. Dogs don't notice because, uh, you know, our, our main friend, that pup in this movie, he doesn't know that he's surrounded by pod people. I guess as long as his master is still playing the banjo. <laughs> oh, God, I forgot about that. Hmm? What are you talking about? What did you forget? They're good friends. Yeah. They're friends forever now. Aw. Forever and ever. Oh, I love, I so love that part. Like the absurdest humor of just a, a dog with a man's face. And like, like, I want to know what the thought process was. So he was like, well, the, the image is so silly. I just wanted to put the banjo music over it and like, or something like that. This is what I imagine the director would be saying. But, oh, I love that. I love that little touch. And there, there's a whole bunch of absurd humor things that happen in the movie that are like, like kind of release the tension of like how scary things are. Yeah. Yeah. And there is, there are parts where there's like real life conversations. Like I was, like I noticed in um, The Exorcist that there was like a, mm. a sense of realism. Yeah. It wasn't totally out of the realm of possibility because you felt like you were in the real world with real people talking and like there's a part where he's telling her a joke and she's like oh you have told me this one before like that which is so real world yeah exactly that's what would happen in real life is like sometimes part way through somebody's like oh yeah you did tell me that before yeah brooke adams in this movie is so good being like this the person who's like feels like she's losing her mind and trying to explain it to people and and not you know like you if you're in that situation that's exactly what it'd be like like i know i sound crazy i know what i'm saying is crazy but this is what i've been experiencing and i need help but i don't think i'm crazy like yeah what do you do in that situation yeah i mean you just eat, eat bok choy and you know Live you your life, I guess. To, you talk to one of your male friends that you have a lot in common with. Well, she has several. Like to, like to hang out with. Several male friends. I I think that maybe this, uh, maybe they were destined to be together. They were just, they were friends. And then this situation kind of made her see, like, that he was the person in her life that she could turn to and rely on. Yeah, I don't know what the situation is because, like, when he jokingly says, uh, well, you could just leave him, you know, the first time she says that he's mm-hmm. he's acting weird, mm-hmm. she's like, he owns the house. So it's like, it's not out of the question that I might leave him. Yeah. No, it does seem like, the, or maybe they've had conversations about him in the past where he insinuated that he wasn't the greatest guy for her or something. I don't know. Well, we know he should be left because one of the first things we see him doing is... Yeah, that's not cool. Snapping at her? Snapping at her to get get her attention or whatever? I I don't even know. I don't get it either. I'm not a big fan of people who snap at you in order to get your attention to begin with. Anytime. It's Uh -uh. so... Not cool. It feels demeaning. It's a pet peeve to me. Yeah. Feels like a... Like, 
I once had a coworker who liked to do that, and yeah. it drove me up the f- uh, freaking wall. <laughs> Let's slap him. Uh, not cool. Not you cool. snap at me, I'm going to smack you. I don't know why, but it doesn't bother me that much. I mean, I can get why it would bother people, but... Um, well, I understand that in certain situations, maybe you're on the phone with somebody, you know, I, I snap real quick, like, hey. No. But even, I would still say hey or something, <laughs> Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. I think talking to a person is, uh, yeah, a better way of communicating. My only experience with being snapped at it is when I was working and a customer was like, "Excuse me," like servant thing. The very first time I remember very clearly was I was working at Magic Mountain and somebody went, "Oh boy!" Oh wow! And I gave him this look like I was going to kill him <laughs> wow but being a teenager it didn't have very much effect yeah <laughs> wow so yes i didn't like her boyfriend either <laughs> <laughs> i thought it was okay i mean he didn't seem very nice when he was you know no longer him seemed rather cold and indifferent yes uh I don't know why, but I found the idea of wearing your headphones and watching TV to be the funniest thing. My grandfather yeah, used to do that. Yeah, how did they do that? I don't know, but it made me laugh like every time I saw it for some reason. He and, had cool headphones. I mean, I wear my headphones and I'm like, you know, looking at something on my phone, you know, but which is probably like the same equivalent to what he was doing in the 70s, you know, but yeah. for whatever reason, just like... like was it the scene where they were sneaking into the house and he was in there? Yeah, we're that in was the headphones. one that made me laugh the most. Where he was, it, it's not even that funny of, a, of an image, but just the idea of him just like with his headphones on, like he's in the house by himself. Like, yeah, why? why, why are you... What are you doing, dude? <laughs> well, I think like that goes into like him taking on the personality and traits of the character, right? Yeah. So he's still completely dressed, except he's not wearing his jacket. He's, he's, he's I think he's wearing a bow tie. Oh, that's right. He was still wearing his business attire. And at first you don't see what he's looking at, but later when Donald Sutherland is sneaking up the stairs, you do see. And what he's watching is, like, after the station has gone off, and it shows the different clocks with the international times and stuff like that. So he's not even watching something that would like have a, a sports thing or yeah. whatever he's whatever his interest was beforehand right. so it's just like this kind of zombie thing like this is what he used to do he used to wear his headphones and watch tv oh. like i don't know if maybe the pod people don't have to sleep at all May, uh, because they are all up at you know whatever hours okay of the night. so it's just some form of imitation of the prior life and it's still silly like it's silly and absurd but it yeah. is kind of like that's weird but that's yeah, that's that's kind of the whole yeah, you're right. The whole the whole message behind the movie is just that that unnerving feeling just just bit off. Yeah. Like trying to imitate like I I'm trying to think of a situation like like uh if I bought a frozen pizza and put it in the oven, but I didn't turn the oven on because I didn't know about that particular instruction. Pod person, Joel. And then I just waited for a while and then took it out. Oh. It like It's like, you didn't turn the heat on. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's like... I'm taking notes, Joel. I forgot. You're imitating what it looks like to do the things that you do without really knowing the meaning behind why you're doing it. Yeah, I'm adding this to my Rorschach's journal when the pod people happen, Joel, as and one of the first talk about lines. The things that I'm going to do that I wouldn't normally yep. do. Yep. I, I would scoop the cat boxes and never fill them with litter. I'd just be like, <gasps> eventually run out. <gasps> okay, taking notes. See, that makes me sad. I would never do that. My poor babies. Oh, your babies. They're little toshes. Oh, don't worry, Joel. You're a good cat dad. Oh, oh you don't have to tell me. I'm number one cat dad. You. Well, yeah, it's true. Coco, go to your room. Is uh, Coco like the Fresh Prince of the Bel Air to your un- your uncle? Uh, uncle Phil. Uncle Phil. No, yeah. she's my baby. What? <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> no. <laughs> so you guys uh, like that Leonard Nimoy guy? I heard. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's okay. Yeah. I mean, he sang a song about hobbits. Yeah, a great Bilbo, song. Bilbo Baggins. Mm-hmm. I think he got as much play in real life as he does in this movie. You know. It's, he seemed like he kind of was a little suave. 
I have a feeling Leonard Nimoy in, in, in IRL was pretty suave, mm-hmm. especially during the filming of this movie. Oh, yeah. This is probably the peak peak Leonard Nimoy suave moment, you know? He was like, hey, ladies, you want to see the paw? Ladies. Oh. Oh, my. Um. <laughs> Science officer uh, Spock, you can you can observe me if you want. He was a, a bad guy in an episode of Columbo around this time, mm. and he was wearing a lot of the same like leisure wear that he wears in this, like just, a just his clothes, yeah, blazer, um, kind of flared <laughs> pants, hey, not neck. actual costume. Just <laughs> you can tell he's an academic. He's got patches on his elbows. Oh, right. I, I'm about this 70s wardrobe, too. I used to get these, like, corduroy blazers and stuff from the thrift store when I was in high school. Nice. And I still, I still like a good blazer, um, sport coat. <laughs> uh, I love it. See, I know, I know, yeah, I can't wear anything, like, you know, I wear my overshirts, but they're a very specific kind. I don't, I can't be a blazer person because I can't feel constricted in that way, I feel like. I used to have to wear this blazer when I was in jazz band and like it was too it was big but it was too tight on the arms so it's like I'd have to lift my arms and I could feel it like pinching into my armpit uh, and that's how I know I'm worst. not an alien what <laughs> uh, plus you could do that weird thing with your eyes oh yeah yeah show me that thing <laughs> oh yeah totally <laughs> everybody could do that no, uh, I mean that's is that that's some actor's resume stuff. I assume. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like they they. Uh, I almost have a feeling that they were just like, like the director was just like, "Can you guys just have a conversation?" Goof off, yeah. Oh yeah, I wonder because a lot of it felt genuine, like ad libbed kind of thing. Yeah. A lot, a lot of conversations between between those two characters seemed very genuine. They certainly seemed natural. The, yeah. Natural, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. I then, really, yep. Then there's Jeff Goldblum. Oh, that's right. Oh, I man. was just gonna say uh, I love Jeff Goldblum in this movie. Me too, because he really thinks the whole world is already against him. Yeah. <laughs> and that got, like just his introduction, I and mean, he's like, <laughs> like, what do you, what does he say about? He's like, he's he's terrible, or he's <laughs> or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the lady's like, how could you say that about a man like him? Like, I'm not saying it about a man like him. I'm saying it about him. <laughs> yeah. That's so good. The reiteration. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah, I mean, he's, yeah, he's put upon in that, that whole, there's so many questions I have that I want to know the answer to that I'm not going to get from the movie, but it's like, I can't help but wonder, like, because when he goes back and, and he's he meets up with his girlfriend and he's getting ready you know he's he seems like he's defeated for some reason you mm. feel bad for him and then yeah. he's just standing there and he's literally just a single tear coming out of his eye and i want to know what in particular he's so upset about like i think it must be like a a, a jealousy rage type thing like i feel like i'm so much better at writing than this asshole and i will never be as famous as him i yeah nailed it you nailed it i definitely believe that he feels that that he his work will never be appreciated. I th- yeah. That's rough. That's real rough to have, think, feel that envy, you know? I think yeah. he's feeling envious, and I think that he also has self-doubt about his own ability. So I think that it's a combination of him feeling that he can't do it, and also him feeling like he tries, but that he doesn't see anything happening the way he sees things happening for a And he feels like he's being that guy's being insincere, and that makes him upset too because yeah he's kind of a funny guy even though he's very emotional about writing he's passionate and single-minded i mean it's like his character could have lived on and and become uh dr ian malcolm from jurassic park you know like okay i'm giving up on this writing thing i'm just going to become a a mathematician you know what forget math i'm going to become a chaotic chaotician or whatever he says yeah just like talking about like whatever whatever comes into his mind magically, but I don't know. Le- okay, so to go back to Leonard Nimoy, he's an asshole in this movie, even before he becomes a pod person. <laughs> well, that's that's my question is is like, did we actually ever see that's Leonard what Nimoy I too. as a person? I mean, I think so because when he 
You when, think so? When him and Brooke Adams are out on the street and he's talking to her, he he's very he's passionate. Like, okay. like the things you see, you know, it's it's like, yes, I see the relationship are changing. And then he does that thing to Jeff Goldblum where he like yells at him uh, and he goes back to him and like he's smiling. I guess that is a kind of the opposite of what a pod person does. Yeah. Yeah. He's showing too much passion for things to begin with and yeah. If I had been there and somebody had done something like that, I just think that that is not cool. I think it's like a, it's something people do to try and get attention and to try and, you know, prove a point get a without reaction. really thinking about the feelings of others. Absolutely. And, and I don't, I didn't, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh my God, that reminds me of people who've like tried to prove a point by doing ridiculous things. And, uh, I don't, I don't a fan of it. And obviously, like, in the movie, the character Jeff Goldblum plays is like, what the hell is that all about? You know, like, <laughs> and it's like, oh, he's trying to prove a point to her out there. He's working. He's, you know, doing his thing. But I think it's partly directed at him, too, because he tries to get him to leave them behind when they're leaving the bookstore. So, like, I think that there is an underlying, like, superiority that he, and he's angry because they're, he's following them. Right. And, and Nimoy's character has shown before that, like, he doesn't want anyone to interrupt when he feels like he's working. Like, when Brooke Adams is, is trying to interrupt him talking to that other woman who's saying that her husband is not her husband, he's just like, will you be quiet? Will you, you know, he's being, like, totally, like, flippant. Like, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I'm fixing this woman. You know, I'm going to fix her kind of thing. And that I think that goes with it there, too. Because he won't even listen to... The only time he seems to actually calm down and act like a normal human is when he's talking to Donald Sutherland. Like, I don't know if he feels like they're on the same level or something like that. Or if it's a... Uh, yeah, I'm not even sure. Well, the thing is... It, Donald Sutherland's character is very... Is very, um... Sexy? I, I, no, 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 no. I'm just trying to think of the proper word. Like... He feels that Leonard Nimoy's character is uh, whatever his 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 process is, is that it, that it's appropriate. I, right. I'm trying to under I I don't know the word uh, complicit just doesn't seem like the right word for it. But like Donald Sutherland's, Sutherland's character is going along with whatever yeah. Nimoy's character is doing because he feels that this is like some radical form of psychology that's that's like that's like proper or or should be explored. Um, right. Complicit just doesn't seem like the right word, though. No, you, you, I mean, uh, he trusts him. Yeah. So yeah. he, obviously, that's what he's thinking. Like, my friend is a good doctor. I'm yeah. going to get her to see my friend. Yeah. So, like, yeah. So, so even when he, even when he was kind of being a super asshole, our, our, our hero is kind of going along with it anyways. Right. This whole listen to reason thing, like, before he knows what's going on, like, nobody's going to believe this, this crazy yeah. thing. That's true. I mean that's that's the problem with being a single man, you know. You you're never gonna have a pod person to compare it to. Good point. Mm hmm. So there's all kinds of weird things that happen in the movie that are like not actually the characters interacting things, and I, I also love that part. Like the just the way the camera will be focusing in on something that's a little bit weird. You know, like uh, you were talking about the the phone cord thing, which oh uh, yeah 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 unnerving. It's unnerving seeing that cord just kind of slide in. It's like it wouldn't be. It's like a perfectly normal thing, probably, every day. Or, like, walking by a window and a person's just standing there. It's like, I wouldn't notice. That happen literally happens all the time. Somebody's standing there. They're probably people walk by me because oftentimes on my job, I'm just standing there waiting for a computer to do a thing and in a store. And I won't look at the person who's walking by me or anything like that. It's like, oh, that guy's a pod person. Well, that's the thing, too, is you, the viewer, like, if you're following the narrative, you're aware of all of these things going on because you saw the space, the space microbes flying, you know, flying at the planet. So, mm -hmm. so you, you yourself as the viewer, are like, just totally aware of, like, 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 like when there's people, like, running in the streets and, like, and, like, you know, our main characters aren't doing anything about it, mm -hmm. like, you're aware that they, that that guy running the streets might be running because he knows something's ha happened. You know, and, and yeah. Yeah. I think that they go out of their way in the beginning to show her, the main woman's boyfriend, as being kind of like an affectionate, like, playful type of person. 
And then as soon as he changes into the pod person, like, he shows zero emotion, and he shows, like, zero affection towards her. And it's like, you would notice if something like that changed in, like, from, like, one day to the next day, that's a complete, like, change in a person's personality. Yeah. And I think that that she knows, like, as soon as she goes to hold him that time and he doesn't do anything back and just turns his back and walks away, like, doesn't even hug her back or anything. Like, I think she's like, whoa, who is this person? And he doesn't even give her an explanation, you know? He isn't like, sorry, I, I'm in a hurry and I kind of don't really feel good or whatever. You know, no explanation. He's just like, he ins- if he alone. does, he insists he's fine. Yeah. Like, I'm perfectly fine. Yeah. That's it. Monotone. Yeah. It's weird how something like that can be um, the, the nonverbal communication can be so um, obvious sometimes. You don't really think about it. Okay, when you live with somebody who's constantly trying to read body, you know, body uh, uh, language and and facial expressions and, you know, uh, things like that, that's, that's, um, Sarah, stop trying to read me right now. I see what you're doing. (laughs) I'm not a pod person. I'm I'm perfectly fine. Sarah, we can meet later. (laughs) We can talk about it. Don't worry. Okay. You jump in the back of a car with a bunch yeah. of people. I just saw, I saw Joel go down to the street. I just he hopped into the back of a car. So take out the trash. the trash again. Yeah, I saw him. There's <laughs> so much trash. <laughs> I got you this flower. Oh my god! I noticed. Oh. I, I noticed that when he fell asleep earlier when we were started recording that uh you know this this other Joel showed up. So hello. <laughs> This is like a happy story. What if like the aliens came and when you changed, you were like a super happy version of yourself and like I want to explore that love and like everything was great. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a romance. It'd be really interesting. Don't, they, don't you think that'd be funny? Like, yes. here's a flower for you. I feel like we could write a version of the story. Yeah, where it's like. You knew, say you worked with somebody, you're you're like a single person, you worked with somebody, one day they just like fundamentally change, and you're like, all of a sudden, you, you're both into each other and stuff yeah. like that. It's like, oh yeah, and by the way, it turns out an alien took over their body. <laughs> That's like, good. Wait a minute. That's good. Well, I mean, yeah. I don't, this I is think weird. It's interesting to think about what if it wasn't the end of the world if something changed you like what if it was like a positive thing oh man what if that's like peel's next movie Ooh. i mean oh you know what th- that reminds me of the monitors right like oh yeah like we're changing <laughs> we're changing things for the better like <laughs> even though you think things are strange now sarah's reaction <laughs> there will be good. no no war oh, yeah <laughs> oh, the monitors there. that Take movie <laughs> I don't want to ride in that car with those characters. <laughs> There's plenty of driving scenes in this movie, but there was always like a conversation going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, the window was broken most of the time in this movie, too. Yep. It was like you had a broken view of the world. <gasps> Symbolism. It kind of it kind of reminded me of like three women. Like how it was like Oh, those are definitely odd, aliens. <laughs> odd situations that were kind of eerie without really having a this like a reason you could explain for it being eerie. Shelly Duvall, totally an alien. Yeah. I don't know. Um yeah, movies that have a suspense that's kind of done visually or with sound that's different from the way that yeah, speaking of that, the the way they use the soundtrack, weird, like, sound, like, in the beginning, there's, like, a, basically, like, a, a jazz-accompanied score going on, which is, which is fine. You know, it's, it's like you're watching a different movie when that's going on. But when the scary things are going, it's, it's like a, a simultaneous heartbeat, like, one that's slowly increasing and then slowly decreasing until the beats match, and, and the other one is just staying steady, and it's like, you know, the otherworldly sound like uh like when you're holding something underwater and you press it against like the the surface is like that kind of sound like oh yeah it's so effective 
I love this movie. Sorry. Yeah, I like it a lot too, but it is kind of gross, it and gross. it and it is kind of scary. Like if I was watching it by myself, I'd probably be creeped out. Like if there was like a scale on the gross factor, is this like, um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like a really, really, really super gross movie. Greasy Strangler. Oh, oh, wow. Joel went there. I mean that's the probably the grossest one we've seen for the movie or for the yeah. for the podcast, right? I find different things gross for different reasons. Mm-hmm. This one I find gross because of the idea of like a growth on something. Yeah. That like creepy crawly like little wisps of white yeah. things just reaching out Clinging very slowly you. and yeah. like just like the cloned body kind of things with the, oh, yeah. the stuff all over them. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. that's, you know, with the whole plant kingdom thing kind of freaks me out, like, especially in, like, a zoomed-in way. Yeah. Because, like, a plant looks so different up close than it yeah. does from far away. And I've ne- the, one of the reasons I've never liked mushrooms is because, like, a, a mushroom uh, in its full form has those, like, flaps underneath the the yeah. head part yeah and it disgusts me for some reason like it's always grossed me huh. out and that's like some of the the feelings i get from like the the weird pod people in this movie like there's just these flaps that seem weirdly unnatural to me like what is going on here yeah. i don't know why it reminds me of things that used to creep me out when i was younger like you know just basic like yeah things that give you a creepy crawly feeling like you were saying like the part in the beginning where you see the ball like on the back of the plant with the stuff coming through it mm-hmm. reminds me of um these kids i used to babysit oh no um they they had a garden and they took me out into the garden once and they were like oh this is this spider that has a nest over here and like showed it to me uh-uh. and i Dreamed. I felt so bad for the spider because, like, the spider could tell like something was wrong just from like I don't know the vibration of me screaming or something. Mm. But like, it's natural. It's part. It's part that it's natural, but it's also part that there's like something growing it just, that can it, crawl no, on it you. It feels or unnatural. Like yeah. it looks so yeah. unhuman that yeah, you can't help but feel just like utterly weirded out by it. Spider fear is a, is is a natural human reaction because we want to pr- protect ourselves. Right. Fear. Yeah. Like yeah. You want to danger. It's a de- yeah defense mechanism. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's why I'm afraid of mushrooms because toadstools are poisonous. Oh. I'm not afraid of mushrooms. I just think they're gross looking. Don't buy me any mushrooms. How do you feel about toad? Toad from the Mushroom Kingdom? Yeah. I used to love him, and then Sarah told me that his giant hat is not actually a hat, it's his head, and now I'm disgusted by him. But it's always been his head. You guys are disgusting. Get out of my house. Hop on my Mario Kart. You're just car mad that he might have those spines on the bottom side of the cap. No, I just don't want a big old bulbous mushroom head, head man. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if so? You met somebody with like a <laughs> big old mushroom. Thing can't, can't wait for the next. Hello. Can't wait for the next live action Mario movie. It's gonna be great. Big mushroom people. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that they get we get the giant shoe with the uh, with the uh, screw in the back of it. I was mm. so wrong about <laughs> what I thought some of the other things were in the Mario game. <laughs> Oh yeah, the ducks. <laughs> the ducks that you were right about the mushroom that have people. The shell. Yeah, you're like, why do those ducks have shells? Those are turtles. No. <laughs> I mean, they could be anything. It's a, it's a fantasy world. Just They're like turtles with wings. Yeah. Yep. And ducks with shells. Yes. And mushrooms with feet and no hands. How do you know they're not snails? Because the book says they're turtles. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, I still think the scariest minion, or not even minion, being in a super in a Super Mario game is the angry sun. Oh, oh my! From part gosh. three, yes, my gosh. 
That's because that's based on reality. That yeah. frightened me as a kid. The angry sun. The angry sun level. Yeah, you're running through the desert and it like swoops down at you, then like swoops back. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's not fun. Sun don't get me. It's like a boo, except the boo isn't that big. Ah or the giant fish in the fish level. That's yep. also bad. Anyways, back to this movie. Oh right. So <laughs> the part when like there's only basically the four of them left. There, there's Jeff Goldblum, there's Brooke Adams, uh, Donald Sutherland, and uh, Veronica Cartwright, who is also excellent in this movie. Veronica Cartwright. And ha- an alien, right? Having to massage yeah. that giant fat man. <laughs> oh, the belly, yeah. I mean, he's not that fat. We, he, we he started that like belly. He is fine. We started that belly for a moment, though. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah. You know, that music is good for the plants. Her plants love that music. Yeah. Maybe that's why Jeff Goldblum's clone grew so fast. Because, oh, because of the music. I mean, we didn't even see a pod, so where did that thing even come from? I think maybe they did show us a plant for a brief second, but I don't think we got a real clear view, like a yeah. zoom in, like, at the other woman's house. Yeah, there was an insinuation that she had a lot of plants. That's why the right. music was playing, I assumed. Yeah, the weird guy with the book was like, gave her some plants, so mm-hmm. who knows? It could have came from anywhere. Man, I've never seen a guy stare so intently at a book before. He loved that book. And I like, I like the absurd joke. Like, is this guy farting? Because it's all coming out of the middle section. But I guess we see the mud bubbling later, and it's not passing gas. But like, this guy, this guy's just letting it loose. I feel bad saying this, but I just felt like that whole place was gross. Oh yeah. Oh, it was Ooh. gross. It just felt like I there wasn't a place to be clean in there. I <laughs> like you could shower. But you were on all these tiles that everyone shared and, like, had come with their own shoes and their own stuff. And Yeah, I feel like you're walking out of there with some sort of foot fungus no matter you what you do. a ta- little towel. You gotta try to climb out of the mud. And there- the tile was so small and there's so much grout in between all of it that it was like, it felt like maybe you couldn't guarantee it was clean in there. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't even <laughs> want to know what the situation. Like, did they own that place too, or was she just like, what's? The, I don't want to know. Yeah, it's gross. I've and I was thinking, I haven't seen that in very many movies, and I think there's one in the Grand Budapest Hotel. Oh, like a mud style yeah. bath thing. Uh, I feel like there's one in in uh, Eastern Promises. In Eastern Promises, there's definitely a bathhouse, but yeah. I've never, I don't know if we had like mud. the same mud bath type thing. You see Viggo Mortensen's mud, but you know, that's Oh mud. my. Uh, anyway. It's a vulnerable space. I think, <laughs> yeah. that's, I think that's how you feel in this too, is like, these people are like unclothed, they're yeah. in the middle of a place and you're like, ooh, there's alien things creeping around. No kidding. Yeah. Nothing to protect you. Yeah. Uh, uh, so what I was going to say was those four people are like the only people that they know of that are left. And the the movie does such a good job of projecting this feeling of hopelessness. Because it's like they can't sleep. They know bad stuff will happen if they sleep. And they think even if I'm watching over a person that, you know, I don't know what's going to get. And there were so many situations where somebody fell asleep and then it just started to like happen, you know, started to creep over. And then like that whole scene where Donald Sutherland falls asleep outside and the, oh man, that is a messed up. That's a gross part. That is gross. And, like yeah. a whole bunch of pods just start spitting out like half human things. And, there were so many, there were so many there. At his house, that it really grossed me out, um, and how quick they grew and everything—it's kind of insane. You don't know how much time has passed since, like, the first beginning sequence. Yeah, it does a lot of visual storytelling without having to tell you in words. But um, I kind of really like that. Yeah, though. I do too. I feel like it's kind of like when you're reading a comic, you can see. Like something happening through a sequence of images. Oh, it's like it's like the opposite of being spoon fed everything. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. And that's great that way. Yeah. That's 
that's the same thing I feel you were talking about natural conversations. And, yeah. Uh, it's the way I feel the exercise handles it too. Like they're not hand holding you oh. to tell you what's going on. Yeah. Like good parallel could, there. You could just read what's going on. Uh-huh. Yeah. They have a lot in common that way. Yeah. I mean, get, when they get to the point where they're running constantly from these things, it, it's like so terrifying. Like, because they're uh, like those cloned pod people become monsters in a way that <laughs> is not unimaginable like i i feel like i've because of uh anxiety i feel like i've sometimes been in like a whole bunch of people and i'm like oh, they're all gonna turn around and point at me and scream or something like that i don't want this to happen <laughs> you know, and this is like literally chasing them down all over the place un you know relentless like police vehicles because they, when they take on the personality of the person, you know, they naturally get all their skills and stuff like that. It's like just a scary idea. And when they get cornered and Jeff Goldblum is like, don't worry, I mean, I've got a plan and stuff like that. It runs off. You're like, well, he's dead. I know there's no way he's going to like succeed in something like that. Like he, he knows he must know he's sacrificing himself. It's yeah. I think that's after Leonard Nimoy shows up and injects them with like sleeping medicine too or whatever. Yeah, they were so hopped up on the speed though. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. They took drugs together. Oh yeah, they were into it. Give me some of those sweet, sweet drugs. <laughs> Aaron, give me the drugs. Okay, here you go. Thank you. I'm your pusha man. I'm your pusha baby. <laughs> Um, yeah, it makes them feel really isolated yeah. and it makes them, it makes it feel hopeless because they don't know who they can trust, if anyone, and it starts, in the beginning it feels kind of like, um, <laughs> in a much more scary way, like Little Shop of Horrors or something. Oh, yeah. It's like a plant and mm-hmm. it's, it can, yeah, it, there's like this odd kind of based in reality situation but and then towards the end it starts to feel more like um like we were remembering watching Soylent Green and stuff for sure because he's going to where like the base is where they're where they're having like a greenhouse and stuff of where they can get more of these plants oh yeah and yeah that scene is intense. Yeah. It, like, he has to leave Rook Adams there and run off because she she falls asleep and he can't wake her up. And then he runs into there and he just starts, like, you know, busting all those cables as much as he can. Like, that whole place is going up. And people are just like, i got to grab this pot and walk out real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no guy that caught on fire, so uh, minus two points. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed, too, that we didn't see a guy walk out on fu- in flames or fall through a window or mm-hmm. something. Casually with a pod in his arm on yeah, fire. Yeah, on fire as well. Yeah. I mean, it gets those two points back because we see the, the dog with the man's face, though. Oh, man. <laughs> when we're standing... Uh, Whoa. That happens before that because they're standing in line pretending to be... Oh, yeah, they're pretending not to have any emotion to pass. That was the, the cover-blown moment, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, that's a natural reaction. Like, part of me wonders if, like, if the dog, dog person was actually making the banjo noise as it was coming up. Like, it was, it was like some, cause, cause, uh, some strange amalgamation of all these things, all these elements. Part dog, part banjo, part man. Or, or if it was the, or if it was the, uh, the interpretation, like, like the memory. Like, the, the characters were, were, were remembering the banjo music. As the creature was yeah. <laughs> slowly descending upon them, that's that's probably yeah. <laughs> spoiler for a little part of um, Annihilation if you haven't seen it. But the but there's a part in Annihilation where something that's a creature has the ability to make a sound, and it sounds like a it's, person. Yeah. Like it's like making the sound of a person begging for help or like screaming, and it's so scary. Because it is legit terrifying. Yeah, it is. It's terrifying. And this this part where the weird creature is like kind of like the thing, like you were saying, this weird creature comes up. 
But it was also kind of this weird moment of like trying to understand what what it was trying to do and that it was yeah. so wrong and so not human. Like right. that it didn't know that <laughs> what it was doing would be terrifying or, <laughs> you know, just, <sighs> yeah. I think that the original intention of the, like the movie from the 1950s was to be a metaphor for communism. Like your friends might be change in a way that's almost imperceivable. That's communism taking over, you know, kind of thing. Like, Everyone you know might be a communist. Keep your eyes out. Are they acting strange? Probably a communist. <gasps> so it's like, in this movie, you can almost see that kind of going the same way. Like, all of a sudden, like, people are acting weird. They're having these secret meetings. <gasps> and secret meetings? Handing off things to each other. And it's like, you know what else is crazy? This dog with a person's head. <laughs> like, wait, 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 what? Yeah, what I'm saying is that uh, that's absurd. <laughs> like, okay. it's not just going to slowly take over the world. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. For, <laughs> I just, yeah. I mean, it's a nice little scare there, you know? Like, I, it's so un- unexpected. I, I could imagine I could imagine being in the theater at the time when that came out and just, just the number of, whoa! Yeah, like, I could only imagine. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not a jump scare. It's just there's been nothing like that in the movie. I'm, I'm that's I'm going to be honest, the first time I saw this movie, I was kind of falling asleep. But that's just because that's my normal thing, you know, at Put the end of the day. Yeah. At the end of the day. Oh yeah. Uh and I was kind of falling asleep when that was, when that was occurring and uh but Campo was still watching the movie and and when the dog thing showed up, Campo just screamed like as loud, oh. as loud as she could. Totally woke me up, and I and, and I, I hear this banjo going off, and I see this dog face thing, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a crazy dream, man. That's funny. That was the first time that I ever saw this movie. Yeah. I, I love it though. I love this movie. Yeah, it's so. I mean, it's good. It's really good, yeah. and it's what so well made. So there's been there's been four of these. There's the fifty six one. Okay. There's this one. There is one called uh Body Snatchers, which came out in the eighties, which I think is is like super gross. Like I don't really know much about it. And then in the two thousands there was the one with Nicole Kidman and Daniel Craig called Invasion. Invasion. And uh from what I heard that one's not very good at all, but like this, this is another one that's just been adapted a whole bunch of times. It's like uh, uh, a star is born, <laughs> but with aliens. Cool. <laughs> okay. Anyway, anything else you want to say about a uh, invasion of the body snatchers? Anybody? I like the scene where um, they were in the building that they worked in and they were hiding was really effective and scary and it was just they had to split up she and donald sutherland were hiding like under a desk and like jeff goldblum and what was her name karen uh nancy cartwright nancy cartwright yeah Oh, Veronica Cartwright. Veronica Cartwright. Nancy Cartwright Sorry. is the voice on The Simpsons. <laughs> um, yeah. I um, I found that part really scary when they separated. And, and that moment of like, you know, I don't know if we're going to make it out of this type situation. And the, the movie is super scary. And at the end, you don't, you don't get any sense of, a good feeling at all. Oh yeah, and not end whatsoever. is scary too. That was probably that the one ending. thing that gave me a jump scare watching this movie. Yeah. Well, you you wonder if like if he's he made it, you know? Because yeah. Because they they kind of learned you can pretend as long as you don't stir up anything, you could be fine. And we see him not following the crowd, but yeah, it's it's such as my such favorite a my favorite image in the whole movie right there. Yeah, so good. Yeah, I was just looking up. I looked up the book just to see out of curiosity if there was anything. And I I probably would have to spend time, like, you know, really reading about the book. But it, yeah. seems, it seems like a pretty well-made story that was only put out, like, a year before the original movie. And oh, wow. So, really? Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. It's surprising that yeah. it caught on so fast and that it's had so many versions. Because there's a lot of science fiction books that never get turned into movies. Absolutely, for sure. And some that really should. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they should make a TV series out of the 20, 2001 book series. Whoa! Like, season one covers the first book, second book, third book, you know. Yeah. So like a four season. Let's do a petition series. that no one will pay attention to. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. Let's got Denis Villeneuve after he's done with Dune. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Could just do all this stuff. Yes. And he's just my pick for everything, though. Um, Neil Blomkamp would be pretty cool, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, they could do separate seasons, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, James Cameron can't touch it because he's... Well, he's busy with Avatar aliens. He's busy being goofus. <laughs> I wonder if the next Avatar movie is just going to be like everyone wearing VR helmets. Oh, you mean us? Yep. Oh, yeah, probably. That guy who did Jane Eyre in the first season of True Detective. Oh, oh Carrie Fukunaga. Yeah. yeah. Like that. that would be great, too. Yeah. Carrie, Carrie Joji. Yeah. Okay. So we got three. Number four could be. Uh, uh, I don't know. M Night Shyam. No. <laughs> oh, no. tie it together with a twist. No, thanks. We'll figure it out later. Anything else? Um, Tony Shalhoub was married to the lady that is the main actress. In Brooke that. Adams. Yeah. What, yeah. Was were they married at the time that this movie came I out? I don't know. You think he saw her in this movie? It was like I've got to. Get that woman's <laughs> I number. <don't> know. <laughs> she looks good as a clone and as herself. <laughs> she could do that thing with her eyes. <laughs> no, I don't have anything. All right, I think uh, I think I'm pretty good too. I, uh, uh, you know, for those of you who haven't seen this movie yet, I'm I'm sorry we spoiled the entire thing for you, but I hope you really uh, I hope you watch it and enjoy it. Yeah. There, there are two questions I have for you, Aaron, that we, we should talk about okay. before we're done. Number is one. Like, is this like some type of a Cylon and or replicant uh, test we're doing no, right now? No, they're just very specific or Aaron style pod questions, which I, I I think these are good updates. Okay, uh, I'm ready we, to we hear. You know, Sarah's mom probably has seen it, but we're not sure necessarily because All right, Joel, nature. Prepare what myself. All right. Oh, what's your question? Have your parents uh, talked about this movie? Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I think... Uh, I told my parents I'd seen it, and, and I believe my mom went, oh, yeah. <laughs> the standard answer. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've seen that. Oh, I've seen that. Oh, yeah. Spooky. Scary. Oh, yeah. Oh, your mom oh, yeah. Your mom turned into the mom from Bobby's world, huh? Oh, don't you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, Bobby. Oh, Bobby. Oh, your Uncle Ted. I guarantee my mom has seen this movie, but I, I don't, I never watched it with her. I see. Yeah, this is probably something she was like, oh, you shouldn't Sarah watch this, Sarah. Sarah would be scared, yeah. Yeah. She would have been right. Up until recently, I had a pretty low tolerance for horror movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, easy win to it. They're like, oh, but Joel, she's already seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, yeah, yeah, that's it's baby it's stuff different. now. That's different, though. Yeah. This is this is kind of a different creature, you, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so question number two. Okay. What do you think of that architecture? Pretty huh. good, huh? Which which part though? There's, well, there's, there's a lot of interesting building. architecture here. Yeah. Let's talk about the home. The home. Uh, oh yeah. In which upstairs, in which downstairs. in which are yeah yeah it's a very interesting architecture there. Atrium. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the um office. I the think office. Was, the office. I thought was pretty rad. You know, it's like cool all that marble everywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah very official. Kind of felt a little bit. I uh, a bit of a twinge of uh, the first Hellboy movie, mm -hmm. like the the opening area where uh, when a the agent kind of goes into the elevator right. portion, kind of reminded me a little bit of that. I see. Yeah, just not used to seeing like literally like Marvel. Yeah, like, like not it's today spread off the floor. Not today. Yeah, you don't see that. Mm -hmm. Don't see that anymore. Yeah, I really liked the bookstore. That uh, Nimoy had his signing at, mm. Larry Nimoy's character. He's got like a little loft area. Yeah. yeah it looks really cool. It looked pretty chill. Like yeah. I would chill there, you know, read a book. I, I, there were actually some really cool colors on the wall too, like some nice blues and stuff. Mm. I, I felt we were pretty chill. They had that weird piece of art in their bedroom that's like of, of two people, I guess. I don't, I can't really tell what it is, like, it, it, or if it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, their bedroom. Yeah. Definitely some goals for future life for me. I want an atrium in, in my in my bedroom. 
be so awesome to wake up and stare at some plants every day. I'm down. <laughs> do that now. I kind of, I kind of was creeped out by that. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I think it could be cool, That's but what I'm I saying. think I think it was a little wild and mm. open the way they had mm. it, and I think maybe you're supposed to feel that way because there's like a thing growing in there that can come at you, but big enough for a body. Yeah, but, you know. I see what you're saying. But I think that the only Just, reason it creeped me out was because I felt like it wasn't really enclosed. And, uh. Yeah, I'm not sure. Also, the actual structure of that thing, I've seen a lot of things nowadays that were built back then that way that look kind of like not so great anymore. No. <laughs> but I think, I think you can have an awesome atrium in your house. If you built it right. <laughs> yeah. I'm also a fan of a lot of those townhouses in in the Bay Area. The outside. Totally. The outside. Um, the trim mm -hmm. and the windows. I really like that a lot. Yeah, they're pretty. I'm a big fan of that style. It's like, like a Victorian yeah. kind of thing going on. And they've got all those colors. Down for that. You just, I am down. You can tell it's San Francisco right away with those houses and those colors and the water. It's yeah. kind of funny because whenever I watch uh, movies with this the, this amount of like seventy stuff, I always feel like I was born in the wrong era or something. Yep, because I'm like I want to be there. Seventies, the yeah, eighteen seventies, eighteen seventies, Wild West time, post Civil War. Oh no, I don't know why, but it reminded me of, that was like a Back to the Future three moment for me, where right? just seeing myself me like in the West or something. Mad Dog all, Cornelius. All the best sweaters. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's oh, why you want to go 70s, 70s sweaters. Oh, man. I, here for it. I'm about here for it. it. Post, yeah. post Charles Manson pre uh, I'm going to yeah. yeah. start a new Pinterest. I'm going to start a new Pinterest where I'm just going to... 70s sweaters. Yeah, 70s cord. sweaters. Pinterest, yeah. I mean, that stuff is just gonna all... going to pin it all. <laughs> pin it. Okay, what you Like really a machine wanna... gun. I'm going to load up a bunch of ammo and just pin as many 70s sweaters as I can. What you listeners want to do... Is is time travel to the early '90s and then just go to all the thrift stores because all the uh, 70s I know. Will be in what there. am I doing in the 2000s, guys? I don't, I don't know. know. I look back on that with uh, yeah, some sweet memories of the thrift stores. Oh yeah, everything was so cheap and everything fit. And oh, this sweater's <laughs> fifty cents. Uh, was, I guess I'll get it. Nothing was seen as valuable yet. Yeah, <laughs> it was so nice. Back then, you could get a loaf of bread for a nickel and a sweater for fifty cents. <laughs> you I really got... could get a sweater for fifty cents, though, Joel. Yeah, you, could, you could do that now. I got. I know a guy. I had some. Pain. I don't want to know that guy. <laughs> He's got sweaters. No. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is a setup, isn't it? There's a uh, van bent in the corner. That guy's me. Going, go in that van, Aaron. Okay, so <laughs> you sweaters can, is the moral of the, the story. Yeah, the lesson I learned is that sweaters are sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you guys think of a lesson you learned from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and I will talk to the audience about outro stuff. Hey, listener, if you are interested in contacting us, please feel free to reach out to us via email at please don't podcast at gmail dot com or message us on Facebook, Facebook dot com slash pdsmios on twitter at at outer space pod and uh, instagram is like pdsmios podcast i think yeah if you uh want to send some dollars our way we do have a coffee site that's at ko-fi.com slash pdsmios uh, for the price of three dollars you can keep aaron caffeinated for these late night recording please, sessions please do he had a delicious mocha tonight, and oh. uh, we, we're going to need some more of that sweet, sweet cheddar. Yeah, to keep his uh, keep his energy up. That's right. It's Thank his you. pick next week. What, what do you, oh. I, I want to know what you're picking, but don't tell oh. me right now. Don't throw me on the spot like. Oh, that. it better be good. Oh man, is it the Garbage Pail Kids movie? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never seen that. That'd be pretty Ooh, fun. Perfect. Be pretty fun. Speaking of gross. <laughs> So thanks to David DeRoy for our theme music, Jed Dowtry for our podcast lo logo, and to our loyal listeners, Kim Torres and Scott Patz, and uh, my uh, other co-host, uh, uh, Spencer Seams, uh, on the uh, hey, Spencer. We Cut Heads, the Spike Lee podcast. Thank you very much for your participation in our program. We send you all of our love.
Thanks to everybody who listens. I I really appreciate anybody who listens to our podcast. Oh, of course. Thank you for using your ears to hear us talk. Thank you for using your teeth to translate language into music through the means of podcasting. What? That's interesting. I am so tired. I think this is a... This is the part we're going to turn to a pod person, Joel. So, you guys learn any lessons from pod person the movie? Uh, from pod person one, the movie. We're watching part two, I guess, because the first one's in the 50s. Yes, they're quite fictional, um, these films. Uh-huh. That's what they want you to think, Joel. Who are they, Aaron? Exactly. Exactly. The movie has pod versions of itself. Mm. Oh, yeah. (gasps) Oh, no, you're saying that there's, like, (laughs) fake versions of movies out there that are taking over other versions of movies? We eliminated that plan by getting rid of VHS. (gasps) All right, I gotta go out and find a VHS player. I gotta fight, fight against the... I just saw a whole bunch of horror movies that are being released on VHS as, like, special... special so VHS hipster editions. and cool. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, there's no way I want those things, but I kind of want those I things. I kind of want those things. No. Uh, well, Joel, Sarah, a lesson that I learned from this movie. Uh, say you're a... You, the listener, that you uh, work for the health uh, agency. Health department. Health department. Your civil servant. You're a civil servant. Uh, you're going to go do your day job thing. Uh, my advice to you and what I learned from this movie, park your car as far away, as far away as you can yeah. from where you're going to tell people that they could be arrested. Because guess what? You're going to get a wine bottle through your windshield. Yep. This is what I learned from this movie. 100%. A pod person would never throw wine balls through a window. It was early enough in the, in the chronologically that they were definitely not pod people. Right. What I'm saying is we're better off. We should all just be pod people. No, just park far away. Go for a walk. Pod. Save America. <laughs> I guess nowadays you could just take an Uber to to go tell someone bad news. I just realized we are pod people. Is that a caper, Joel? Podcast people. Oh... Sarah, do you have a lesson? Um, I learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Lay it on me. Um, I think my my best lesson. There's a lot you can get from this movie, but my biggest lesson is you should be suspicious if someone's taking out the trash all the time. Oh, that's why I never take it out, no matter how many times you ask me. Ditto. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are joking. We are quite humorous. Yes. Ha ha ha. Not a pod person at all, Joel. Why would you ask? Why would you even think that? I don't know, Aaron. Ha ha ha. What's your lesson? You were born out of a pod, after all. I... <laughs> why don't? Why? Why am I wearing headphones and watching TV? I don't know. Leave me alone. My my lesson is that uh, animal companions are great, and if I were to be turned into a pod person, I would hope that I was some sort of cat-human hybrid. With the Joel face? Because with I would be face. eternally happy. Pascal with my face. Would you make banjo noises everywhere you went no, to? No, it'd be like, it'd be like uh, you know, ooh no, <laughs> Oh, new metal? Oh, no. New metal cat person? I guess we're watching Queen of the Dead next. <laughs> we already, we already experienced that, Joel. Ah, not for the podcast. The unrecorded viewing of that movie. That was just, that was just funsies. <laughs> oh. No, you you would have, like, audio of, like, a podcast. Oh, yeah. It would be like... <laughs> Yeah, it, like it would be like a bunch of people talking like, well, about you're... a movie or something. Be the Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> My other lesson is don't bring a strange plant into your house. Yeah, it's a good rule in general. You know, you might release some weird allergens, or there you might be tons of aphids on it that you can't see. Oh, secretaphid.com. How did you know about my website? I didn't until now. (laughs) 
You've been, you've been you've been hitting my search history, haven't you, Joel? I knew it. We'll see you next week, folks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.